Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Taglier. We're on Twitter, you can follow us, at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Taglier NFL. Tags, how's it going, man? It's good. It's really good. I, I, I'm guessing that you don't watch Game of Thrones, which kind of... I, I wanted to have a conversation about it today on the show. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but I really wanted to talk about it, and unfortunately, you don't participate. I mean, I don't really watch tv much except for sports but i mean i i've read enough on twitter to probably know everything <laughs> that's going on so why don't you just have the conversation with me? oh you might you might know enough but it's just there was so much emotion in this last sunday's episode that so many people were watching and then like the the game seven was on so people were watching that and then waiting to watch game of thrones and man I, like i said i'm not trying to give spoilers away to anybody but it was a fantastic episode and what's been it just feels like it's been a rushed season like they're trying to fly through everything too fast and Man, I just wish they'd take their time a little bit more, but there's only one more episode, so. I can't say whether or not I agree, but um, we'll just let everyone else have the conversation with you. If you have a response to that, <laughs> hit up Mike on Twitter at Mike Tegler NFL. Sorry, I don't have anything to say, dude. I'm c- kind of boring. Yeah, unfortunately. I thought I was a boring person, but then I met Bobby and I realized I'm not as boring as I thought. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just sitting there reading books and stuff like that. <laughs> That's my thing. Um, Anyway. So I have a little bit of disappointing news. You all knew I was going to get a blonde mustache. Well, apparently my skin does not react well to bleach. My uh, hairstylist who was going to do it on the video and everything was like, hey, you should check this out first before you, you know, go and put bleach on your face. So uh, my skin reacted. We're not going to do that. However, I did lose a bet and I'm going to do something even more embarrassing. You all have seen the Keenan Allen photo in George, right? Tex, can you explain this thing? Yeah, if you haven't seen the picture, it's Keenan Allen in like a flowered shirt that's unbuttoned, showing off his, you know, ripped abs and his chest and uh, a pair of jorts. And he's leaning up against a Lamborghini, just, you know, looking like a celebrity. There's no other way to describe that picture outside of him looking like a celebrity. So Bobby is going to reenact this photo in order to make up for not being able to dye his mustache. I've got some plans. It's going to be hot for sure. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to get my hands on a Lamborghini, but probably a minivan. We'll see. We'll see what I can do. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay. So here's the plan for today's show. And we're going to get into it in just a minute. Tags and I are going to be talking quarterback rankings and tight end rankings. Now that the draft is done and we, you know, understand everything about landing spots and who's going to be playing. And there's going to be a lot that sorts itself out over the next couple of months. But as of now, If we're doing drafts, how would we do things just to get you all excited for the season? After that, we're going to be talking coaching change and the fantasy impacts that stem from all of that. Before we do, though, I want to talk to you about pristineauction.com. They were kind enough to give us a Juju Smith-Schuster signed Steelers helmet that one of you is going to take home and be able to put in your cave. This thing is beautiful. You can sign up for it at fantasypros.com slash contest. It takes just 30 seconds to enter. We're going to draw one lucky name to take that bad boy home. And if you haven't seen pristineauction.com, they've got hundreds of items that they auction off daily. I've got my eyes right now on a Joe Mixon signed full-sized helmet. What I like to do is I like to get the guys who you can get them cheaper for now before they break out. And I feel like we haven't really seen Mixon in that workhorse role for a full season. I think it's going to happen this year, and I think he's going to take off. So I want to get my hands on it now while it costs $105 instead of 300 next year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, I mean, the, the new offense there with Zach Taylor, you don't know. It could just kind of like take off and people, as you mentioned, there could just be a breakout season waiting. Do you have a Bengals signed helmet for your collection yet? Ocho Cinco? I got AJ Green actually uh, a couple weeks ago. So yes, AJ Green. TJ Hushmanzada? <laughs> no. <laughs> No TJ Hoosh. Oh, he was awesome, wasn't he? They were so much fun with uh, with Hoosh and uh, Ocho Cinco and Carson Palmer. Yeah, Ocho Cinco. I mean, that dude, I just wish they would have let him shine. I, I, I know they did back then and like the, the NFL starting to come around on celebrations and stuff, but I, I always enjoyed his antics. He was fun, man. He's such a creative guy. Anyway, you all can check out Pristine Auction and see what they have for you. Everything is guaranteed authentic from only the most trusted sources. That's P R I S T. I N E tags. Let's get into it, man. Quarterback rankings. Almost everybody, like 95% of people are going to be taking Patrick Mahomes as their number one quarterback. I've got him there for now, but it's really close with me. And I think the big question is here, you know, who do you have as your number two quarterback? Is it Aaron Rodgers, Andrew Luck? But for you, I think Patrick Mahomes is your number two. Am I right? Yeah, I have Rodgers at number one. And that's who I've got at number two. Most people though have Rodgers at three or even four. The thing is, I'm not going to end up with either of these guys this year. I'm just really not. And, and and that's why it really doesn't matter all that much. But the reason I'm putting Rodgers at number one is we have a proven track record of him producing as a QB1. Like in terms of like, you know, he's finished as the number one 
quite a few times already, and he's he's just so reliable. Whereas Patrick Mahomes, yes, you saw the upside last year, but uh, on one hand, we're almost fairly certain that Tyreek Hill is at the very least going to get suspended for some period of time. And then it's like, it, what if he's not on the team at all? Then it's like, what? Mecole Hardman is not going to fill those shoes. Sammy Watkins has dealt with foot issues throughout his career. You know, there's still talent on that team. Andy Reid's still the coach. I think he's going to be good, but I think there's a lot of things that went Patrick Mahomes' way last year that are, are going to start to, they're going to even out a little bit, you know, like players, this is what happens. It's like, you know, I remember Deshaun Watson, you know, after he had his rookie year, everybody wanted to draft him as the number one quarterback over Rodgers. And, you know, Deshaun Watson's fine. I have him at number four this year. So it's like, it's not saying he's a... You do? Oh man, I've got him number eight, dude. Oh no, it's not saying he's a bad quarterback at all. It's just saying that don't hold them to those expectations that are record setting numbers. And especially with Mahomes, like, let me warn someone about this. If you're crazy enough to draft Mahomes in like the third round or second round, you know, that's what it's going to take in most public leagues. Understand this. You're not going to want to trade him as the season goes on because, well, obvious reasons. You drafted him there. Understand you love him more than you probably should. Okay. Kansas City, their fantasy schedule in the playoffs. One, so week 14, they're playing the Patriots, which can really be hit or miss. That game is in New England, but that's fine. But then weeks 15 and 16 against Denver and Vic Fangio's brand new defense. And then at Chicago in week 16, against the Bears, you know, defense that just was dominant last year. And, uh, you know, on top of that, it's going to be December. It's going to be freezing cold. I would imagine that both teams are going to want to run the ball a little bit more. So I'm just not a big fan of Patrick Mahomes in terms of fantasy wise. Like if he fell to the fifth round, sure. But I know that's not going to happen. So I'm not going to draft him. Everyone said he had the best season of all time. And you look at it, 5,100 passing yards, 50 touchdowns. And you might think, okay, well, yeah, nobody else has ever done that before. But in terms of comparing him to the rest of the field, in terms of fantasy points, he was actually number 20 in the last 25 years, um, just because everybody else was so much better as well. The game is changing and you have to compare him to the area he plays in. He was absolutely amazing. But to say he's a lock to finish as the QB1, Guys, I'm not buying that. I think it's him or Aaron Rodgers, neck and neck. Andrew Luck is right up there as well. I wouldn't be surprised at all if Russell Wilson does it. Deshaun Watson, I don't really see as much upside. Like, I love his wide receivers and everything like that, but the offensive line is still a mess. Um, so, I don't know. For me, it's Patrick Mahomes. I would take him if he dropped to the mid-third round, late third round. Aaron Rodgers, I'd take him early fourth. I don't need to. I can wait and take him in the sixth round in a lot of cases. But, you know, I don't mind taking a quarterback super early. You can play the streaming game if you want. I want to use my fab bucks on those running backs and wide receivers or take a defense a week early before everyone else gets to them. I mean, look at what Aaron Rodgers has done in the seasons he's been healthy. This is VBD, value-based drafting. So how good he is over the replacement level player. So for quarterbacks, that's QB 13, 78 VBD. That's second at quarterback, 11th overall, 115 was fourth overall, 17th overall, first overall, ninth overall, 12th overall, fourth overall. That's all we've seen from him in the years he's been healthy. And last year, even playing with a bum leg, he was at number 43. That's about where he's going in drafts. So I can understand wanting to stream and everything like that. But if you can get someone like Aaron Rodgers, who's going to be a top likely 20 overall VBD player at pick 40, pick 60, I'm doing it. That's where I'm at. I just think that there's some safety there. I don't think that you're aiming for the sky. I don't think Rodgers is going to walk out and throw 50 touchdowns like Mahomes did last year, but I'm not aiming for that if I'm taking him in, you know, the fifth round. And which is, I've been able to get Rodgers in, in best ball in the fifth and sixth round this year. Like people are taking Andrew Luck over him. People are obviously taking Mahomes over him. I think the Luck's a little crazy. Uh, you're going to have to rely on that Colts defense to get a little bit worse. And he has to stay healthy. That's my, I know Rodgers hasn't been like the epitome of health, but uh, Andrew Luck has those shoulder issues that can reappear anytime. Yeah. Luck, most people don't realize it with Luck is like he was very consistent last year, but he wasn't like a high upside quarterback. He's not going to win you weeks. He had one performance. I don't know if you know this, Bobby, but he had one game all year long with more than 23 fantasy points. Yeah. I, d I didn't know that. That's a good number. And he actually finished as the QB five last year. And I think he played extremely well. I don't know if it gets much better than what he put up. 39 touchdowns, 6.1% touchdown rate. I mean, that's that's better than Tom Brady's career average. By the way, Patrick Mahomes was at 8.6%. If you think that's sticking around, I don't know what to tell you because I'm sorry that's not happening. If he drops to 6%, he still would have had 40 touchdowns. But 
He's probably not the QB one. Yeah, Andrew Luck is gonna. I mean, they did they did surround him with a couple more talented pass uh, catchers. You know, Devin Funches added is an upgrade over R- Ryan Grant, especially in the red zone. And then you have uh, Paris Campbell taking over for Chester Rogers in the slot. So I do like his weapons. I think Luck I have as my number three quarterback. So I, I like him. But again, these are the quarterbacks that it's really tough to land because people are drafting them inside the top four rounds. So unless they fall, you know, Luck is probably like a sixth rounder for me. Uh, Rogers fifth, Mahomes fifth. I'm fine with those guys because Rodgers and Mahomes, I, I understand why people want to take Mahomes number one, but in the end, he's not going to fall there. So that's why it really doesn't matter all that much. Yeah, there's no chance I'm taking him in the second round. Now, he mentioned Deshaun Watson. I said I have him at eight, which really isn't that much further down from four in terms of overall rankings. Like I would take Andrew Luck in the top 100 if I had to. Then I've got Matt Ryan at four, and that would be like 120 overall. Deshaun Watson's at like 135 overall. So there's really not that much of a difference. But I'm looking at him now. His rookie year, 9.3% touchdown rate. Dropped to 5.1, which is expected. I think that's right on the mark with the type of quarterback he is. Now he finishes the QB4 because he runs so efficiently. Yeah, and that's where I'm at with Watson is that he, he's, he presents such a high floor. And the ceiling is there with Will Fuller, especially in the lineup. And Fuller should be back by week one. He's got DeAndre Hopkins. Kiki QT is actually going to be healthy. Um, their offensive line, it may not be great. And I, I still I still don't think it's great, especially when it comes to their run blocking. But they have added a few guys where they're going to be able to mix and match and say, okay, we're a pass first team. Let, let's, let's put the best guys in here to pass block. Let's not worry so much about the push that they get up front, but rather what they can put up as a wall. So uh, Deshaun Watson last year, he was a, so basically according to boom bust and everything in between uh, the series I do every year, it was on average, it took 19.2 fantasy points to finish as a top 12 quarterback, which is crazy. That's amazing. Like that's nuts. That, that's the highest number that I've ever recorded. That would usually be like QB4 or QB5. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So 19.2 points, but Deshaun Watson, he hit that number in 62 and a half percent of his games. That was number three in the NFL behind only Patrick Mahomes and Matt Ryan. So Watson was just uber consistent. And you really, that's what you're looking for when you're taking a quarterback up here. You don't want someone who's boomer bust because then you'll have to stream quarterbacks. So I like Watson. I just feel like he's relatively safe there. Matt Ryan's my guy. I, I like him a little bit more than Watson. Uh, they got Dirk Cutter coming in there. He's got all those weapons. Uh, Calvin Ridley's a year older. Uh, and Matt Ryan, you look at what he's done the last three years. This has been one of the better stretches in NFL history. We're talking about 4,600 yards per season, 31 touchdowns per season, extraordinarily efficient. And now he gets dirt cutter. I, I'm, I'm on board. Matt Ryan might have had the best year. I mean, I know he, he won the MVP, but uh, last year was one of his best seasons. Like, he was forced to pass a whole lot. My only worry about Matt Ryan this year is that that defense is getting everybody back healthy. And, you know, they're not going to be forced to throw as much. But but fortunately, Dirk Cutter, he's a pass-first offensive coordinator. He knows the team. He's been there before as the offensive coordinator. So I imagine that they're going to walk right back into what they've been, which it's been over 600 pass attempts with Cutter, whether it's in Tampa or Atlanta most of the time. So I think Matt Ryan is relatively safe. I think he's one of those quarterbacks that you could rely on safe production out of him. He's got 600 pass attempts in five of the last seven years, by the way. Where do you feel like you'd feel comfortable taking him? Like the draft board falls as the players you have them ranked. Like where would you take Matt Ryan? What round? Late ninth round. I don't, he's never going to last there though. That's he's yeah, you're right. He's not going to last. That's why I'm going to have Jameis Winston on 80% of my teams. Yeah. Winston is a, is a very popular one among experts, um, in the early ECR and a lot of, a lot of casual fans really aren't going to understand that one. Do you want to talk about him for a minute? Yeah, so Jameis Winston right now, his ADP is 13. That's consensus ADP from a lot of different sources. ECR, which is the expert consensus rankings, has him at 10. And I think that's going to go up as the Cam Newton news comes out that maybe he's not ready for the season. Um, But, you know, when you're four spots higher than ADP, that tells you a lot. The experts love this guy. And the reason why is you look at what Ryan Fitzpatrick and Jameis Winston did combined last season, splitting time. If you make them one quarterback... They were the QB two last year. That's a number that I don't know if I don't think that's obviously sustainable. Yeah, I don't have him QB two. I've got him QB six. Yeah, I have him at ten. I have him right in line with the consensus uh, right now. Is that because I do think Cam Newton's going to be ready? Uh, if he's not, obviously he's going to fall a little bit. Um, but Jameis Winston. You know, Bruce Arians coming there is going to change a lot. So it's not like, you know, the Todd Munkin offense. It's not the dirt cutter offense that, you know, he was throwing in last year. But. 
he does have a healthy Mike Evans. He has a Chris Godwin who's now taking on a bigger role. You know, Deshaun Jackson is gone, but him and Jameis Winston didn't really connect anyway. Uh, OJ Howard, hopefully healthy for the entire season. So it's like the pieces are there. You know, I don't think they have an elite run game that you have to worry about too much. And Bruce Arians, you know, while in Arizona, his teams were scoring points. Um, you know, they do run a lot of plays per game. I think in four of the five seasons he was in uh, Arizona, he they ran at least 64 plays per game, which is very important when you're talking about like projecting an offense. So Jameis Winston is like, this is his make or break year, right? Like they, I, I do feel like he's got some weapons too, man. He is the guy, but they have to make sure. And it's like, this is your year. Otherwise, you know, next year is obviously going to be a, a year where there's going to be some better quarterbacks available. So he's got to make, it's like a make or break year for him. And the weapons are there. I saw a stat on Twitter from Warren Sharp. He's one of my favorite uh, analytical football follows. He was talking about what percentage of passing yards came through the air versus after the catch. So, you know, quarterbacks getting lucky. For instance, Ryan Tannehill, 46% of his were through the air. That means 54% were after the catch. Matthew Stafford, Nick Mullins, Blake Bortles, and then dead last, Ben Roethlisberger at 44%. I know everyone's excited to draft him, but you lose Antonio Brown. Roethlisberger was not that great last year. He just threw 700,000 passes. Um, but Jameis Winston was number one on that list at 68%. Number two was down at 62%. So Jameis Winston's pushing the ball down the field through the air, and he's going to pile up yards again. If he plays a full 16 games... I'd be willing to bet he's over 4,900 passing yards. That's actually a stat that I have in my article, the 175 interesting facts from the 2018 fantasy football season. Um, it's pinned, like if you guys are on Twitter, uh, just go to my Twitter and it's the pinned tweet, like the very top of my profile. Uh, that stat is in there. So Jameis Winston, yes, that stat is absolutely correct. And um, that's why it's it's easy to like him. And he has receivers that can go up and get it, obviously. And Mike Evans is not really one of them, but Godwin and OJ Howard, those guys can do some work after the catch. So I like Winston. I, I do understand that there's some risk with him, which is why I'm unwilling to move him over guys like Jared Goff because there's really no risk with him. Cam Newton, that's like the borderline. It's like, are you healthy? And if he's healthy, how much are they going to run with them? There's a lot of questions about Cam Newton this year. Yeah. So let me ask you this, okay? I'm looking at my list right now. I have 22 quarterbacks that I would be comfortable drafting. 22. We only need to draft 12. And granted, some leagues you're going to draft more, but because we have that many guys and there's going to be streamers, how many quarterbacks would you actually say, okay, lock them in every single week as opposed to streaming? Like if I have Deshaun Watson, I'm comfortable with streaming. I, don't, I wouldn't draft him. He's one of those guys that I would actually be comfortable starting every single week. Where does that list end? Uh, Jameis Winston's not someone I would want to do that with. I don't think Jared Goff's that guy either. So for me, it's Rodgers, it's Mahomes, it's Luck, Watson. That's it for me. Just those three. Watson's in that for me for sure. Russell Wilson's right up there in the conversation. Russell Wilson's fallen a little bit, losing Doug Baldwin, that the team is run first. You know, I want to say Baker Mayfield belongs there, but he doesn't. We haven't really seen it on a consistent basis. Matt Ryan, he's someone that you're probably going to want to start every single week. I think Matt Ryan could make that conversation, but again, I'm going to be doing that whole boom bust and everything in between. And just so you know, Bobby, last year, I mentioned that number, 19.2 fantasy points to finish as a top 12 quarterback or better. There were only... 11 quarterbacks who hit that mark half the time. Wow. Like that's half the time. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty telling, isn't it? It is. And that, that's what I'm saying. There's only two quarterbacks who hit it over 62 and a half percent. And again, that was Mahomes and Matt Ryan. So it's really ugly and it's really tough to ride those guys week in, week out. And would you be happy going with someone like, a, you know, like a Lamar Jackson, like a Kyler Murray? I'd be fine with streaming one of them. Yeah. I've got Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson at 13 and 16. We've got Matt Ryan, week one, at Minnesota. He's not going to be a top 12 quarterback in week one. I'm not starting him. I don't want to start him there. The next week against Philly at home, I like that. And then he has Indianapolis, Tennessee. It's fine. But Minnesota, you're right. Week one, that stinks. So you're gonna are you going to draft a second quarterback? Or you're just going to put Matt Ryan out there? Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm drafting a second quarterback um, that I can use as a streamer. Or I'm just avoiding Matt Ryan and drafting a streamer week one, then I'll figure out my streamer for week two. That's another actually case against uh, Aaron Rodgers is that his schedule, he opens up the season at Chicago, which Chicago's traditionally held him pretty much in check. But nah, he's QB five in week one. But the thing is, is they are running a new offense and the Bears are not really going to have much to prepare for, like to understand what they're going to do under the floor. And then week two, he has Minnesota. And then in the fantasy playoffs in weeks 15 and 16 against Chicago and Minnesota again, like it's bookended by Chicago and Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That's not great. Yeah. So, I mean, basically you're saying just draft a streamer. 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I think it's just easier to do that. And, you know, like there's going to be people, people telling you, like, don't draft two quarterbacks. That I'm not, I'm not one of those people that does that. I'm okay with you. Like, if you say that I'm going to take Mitch Trubisky and I'm going to pair him with someone like Jimmy Garoppolo, I'm fine with that. Like, stream the two back and forth, play whoever has the better matchup. And if you can find someone on the waiver wire who's even better, drop one of those guys. You know what I mean? But if your league, understand your league. Like, I'm in leagues where legitimately they're casual leagues and that's, that's who we cater or two most of the time in casual leagues 20 to 24 quarterbacks are going to be owned by teams leaving you with streaming guys like an Andy Dalton like an Eli Manning a Sam Darnold is it possible that they give you know top five performances absolutely but you don't want to tie yourself down to that though exactly because you never know when they're going to have that top five performance and if that matchup aligns with when you need them I'm, if I'm picking two quarterbacks that I want to go back and forth with I want one safe guy so give me one of Lamar Jackson Kyler Murray and uh, and even Josh Allen, um, and I don't know if a lot of people would consider him safe. Even Mitch Trubisky, I think, is safe because he runs so efficiently. Give me one of those guys, and then give me someone like Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, Carson Wentz, uh, even Kirk Cousins, who is matchup dependent. And I'll start him in weeks where he has good matchups. Otherwise, I'll just go with a running quarterback. Yeah, and that's the thing. And and I should I should say to the other side of the spectrum, like where if you're in a league where it's a bunch of guys that know what they're doing, they know the late quarterback strategy, and there's only, you know, let's say that there's 15 quarterbacks drafted in your league. I'm okay just waiting until like the very last few rounds and seeing who I get and playing that matchup. Look at week one and say, okay, Jimmy Garoppolo starts the year at Tampa Bay. Then he goes at Cincinnati. Those are two phenomenal matchups. So Jimmy Garoppolo, he's currently being drafted, I think, as the 18th quarterback off the board. So he's someone that you could probably steal late in the draft. And then you, everywhere else in your roster, you should just be stacked. I've got him 14. Like, is everyone expecting he's not going to be the same Jimmy Garoppolo when he comes back? He was on pace for 5,000 yards, and he didn't even know the playbook. I'm not saying he's going to be a QB5 or anything like that because he doesn't run at all, but is he going to be any different? I don't think so. We we talked about Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and, J- and Jameis Winston last year. If you were to combine all those uh, 49er quarterbacks, I'm sure you'd wind up with top five numbers among those guys, too, because Nick Mullins had some big weeks, and that's why... I think Garoppolo is one of the best dynasty by lows right now because I think that he is going to wind up like I think after this season, people are going to start putting him back into their top 12 dynasty quarterbacks because he's not there right now. But yeah, I definitely feel like Garoppolo is being undervalued right now. You know, if I'm going with a week one streamer, uh, I'm probably drafting Lamar Jackson going up against the Miami Dolphins because they really have nothing on defense. They've got a good secondary. And so Lamar Jackson's going to throw 12. You know, he's going to throw 14 passes and complete eight of them. Um, but he's going to rush for probably 80 yards because that's l- what Lamar Jackson does. They're going to be playing from uh, from ahead, I would expect, at Miami. If I'm drafting a streaming quarterback, I'm always looking at week one. That's probably the only guy I'll take. Tags, I understand your two-quarterback thing, but I, I don't blame you for doing that at all. That's not exactly my style, though. Yeah, it just depends on, the, on like, like I said, understand your league. Know how many bench spots you have. If you play in a league with five bench spots, no. Don't draft a backup quarterback. Do not do that because then it's just dumb because that, that those five spots are very, very, very valuable. I play in leagues where it's like we typically have at least six bench spots. Um, and there are some of those leagues where, again, there's two quarterbacks drafted, but you know, understand your league settings. And if you guys have questions on that, just uh, hit me up on Twitter. All right. So two quarterback leagues tags. A lot more people are doing this. I hope that the number continues to rise. I want it to be standard within the next five years. I don't think that's too much to ask. It just makes so much sense with us having 22, 23 quarterbacks who are worth owning. It's the most important position in all of sports besides maybe the goalie at hockey. But and we don't treat these guys like this. I mean, we're talking about Patrick Mahomes, probably the best player in the NFL or Aaron Rodgers. And they're not going until picks 20 and 30 because of the scoring settings, the roster settings. I think we need to change that. So I would recommend changing your league to two quarterbacks. It makes it a lot more fun. Even six points for a passing touchdown, uh, negative four for an interception. Let's get the best quarterbacks at the top of the list. But if you're in a two quarterback league tags, who are you targeting? Is there someone down low that you're pretty fond of? I mean, you're looking at the guys that don't have any any worry about losing their job, right? Like guys like, you know, Derek Carr, there's no there's no competition on the roster for him. As much as I don't like Derek Carr, there's no competition. I don't mind Derek Carr so much. In a two quarterback league, I'd be happy to have him. That's the thing is I don't think Carr's bad in a two quarterback league. Uh Matthew Stafford, there's no competition for him. But guys like Marcus Mariota, guys like Andy Dalton, guys like Eli Manning, those are all guys facing competition where it's like don't don't be shocked if they're benched if they're not playing well. Um, and those are the guys you don't really want on your team. 
So I, you're just looking for stability out of that second quarterback. You know, for your first quarterback, you ideally get one of the top 10 guys if you're going to play this strategy, because if you get one of the top 10 guys, they should perform as a QB one more often than not. And then your, your other guy, you just want some stability to give you a safe floor. Like in our fantasy pros dynasty invitational league, it's a two quarterback league. I won last year with Andy Dalton and Drew Brees as my quarterbacks. Andy Dalton obviously went down. I was able to snag a backup, and it was ugly, but I, I actually won the championship there. He got really lucky that I just missed out on the championship by one point. Yeah, I won with uh, Drew Brees and Jeff Driscoll as my quarterbacks in that league, and that's a two-quarterback league. So again, I had Andy Dalton for, you know, until he went down for the year, but my team was stacked everywhere else. So it's understanding that that second quarterback, you just want some stability, a guy that is not going to get benched. That's, that's really what you're looking. So if you want, if you want to go with Sam Darnold, I don't really like him, but he's not going to get benched. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. What about Josh Rosen and Dwayne Haskins? Do you think there's a, a chance that one of those guys starts week one? I think Rosen should. Um, that, that's the thing is, so Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know what he is. He's a journeyman. Um, but Josh Rosen, the Dolphins have to find out if he is the guy. And, you know, I, I said it was unfair to put him in Arizona's situation. I think it's kind of unfair to put him in Miami's, but at the same time, you know, this is his time and he has to make it work. There's, there's no other choice. And, you know, if they start Ryan Fitzpatrick and Fitzpatrick plays well enough, then you're never going to find out if Rosen is that guy. And then you're, you don't know if you're drafting a quarterback next year. So I think Rosen does start week one. Um, but as for Haskins, I don't think that he's going to start right away. I think they're going to ease him in considering the lack of experience he had in college. I think that's fair. All right, man. Let's move on over to tight ends. Obviously, Travis Kelsey's the number one now that Tyreek Hill's got his stuff going on. How high would you take Travis Kelsey? I, I'm actually, I was going through that earlier today, just adjusting some of the top end of my, my rankings. And I think I'd feel comfortable, like with Kelsey, like the number 13 overall pick. That's kind of where I, I think it's fair. It's in, it's somewhere in between 13 and 16 for me. Like, if you want to take him at 13, fine, but I think there's 12 guys that should go before him. I think I'm going to have a lot of Travis Kelsey because I've got him number 12 on my big board. I think his ADP is going to settle in around 15 to 18, and I think that's an absolute steal. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is going to get his. Kelsey's going to be his primary guy. I don't think Sammy Watkins really jumps up and becomes a wide receiver one, so it's Kelsey time. Who do you have? So do you have, uh, is it Le'Veon or David Johnson uh, behind Kelsey? Yeah, I've, I've actually got both of them behind Travis Kelsey. Oh, wow. So I, I'm guessing you have Beckham in front of him then. Yeah, I've got Beckham at number 10, Devontae Adams 11, James Conner 9. Got it. Very cool. Yep, yep. And uh, DeAndre Hopkins down at, at 15, which is going to surprise some people. But Oh, you have Hopkins at 15? Yeah. Woo. yeah he's got a split with Will Fuller and Kiki QT. Oh, I know. You're going to hear you're going to hear some hate for that one, though. You know what? I'm standing I'm standing by it, though. Like, I'd be thrilled to get him at 15. There's a huge drop off after number 15. But do I want him over David Johnson or Le'Veon Bell? No, I would rather have Travis Kelsey. He's my number five wide receiver. I think he's pretty close. To number one, I don't think there's much of a difference between Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins is probably more talented. I'm just worried about the targets. I think it goes down. Yeah, they're probably going to go down a little bit. He has never been on the field at the same time as Will Fuller and Kiki QT. Th here's the thing. I don't think you can go wrong with any of Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, or Michael Thomas. Like, Agree. O Odell, there's there's a few questions. Obviously, he's going to a new quarterback. Sometimes that doesn't pan out right away. But the thing is, he's he's kind of like an outlier um, where you, you want to trust Odell in that group. But I, I think that those four are the top group. And if you want to take any of those guys at the end of the first round, I'm all about that. I, I'm perfectly okay with that. If you want to take DeAndre Hopkins at pick number six, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to judge you. I just don't have him there. Yeah, that's fair. All right, so who do you have number two then? Is it Kittle or Ertz? It's Kittle. Me too. Barely though. I just want to say how impressive his season was. It's just that, you know, setting the record for most yards, like beating out Travis Kelsey, you know, knowing that he was, one was playing with- With Nick Mullins. He didn't play with just Mullins either. He played with Garoppolo. He played with uh, Beathard. So it's just, it's insane what he did. It, while Travis Kelsey is catching passes from Patrick Mahomes, George Kittle is catching passes from those guys, setting records, you know, doing a lot after the catch. I happen to think that Jimmy Garoppolo is going to increase his stock. I don't think the yardage is, I don't think he's going to run for 80 yard touchdowns as quite often as he did last year, but, um, George Kittle is clearly the big guy there on campus and Debo Samuel doesn't change that. Uh, you know, Dante Pettis being a full time player doesn't change that. Tevin Coleman doesn't change that. He's the possession style receiver in that offense and he's going to be the biggest red zone threat for Jimmy Garoppolo. So yeah, he's the guy. Yep. I've got Kittle right now. I would take him in the top 20. I've got him at number uh, 19. I've got Zach Ertz at number 23. Yeah, overall, I, like I said, Kelsey, I could see in that 13 to 15 range. Kittle is closer to the 20 range where I take him. Uh, and then Ertz is a couple picks later, like a 22. 
All right, so once we get out of the top three, I mean, it drops down big time. I'm really fond of O.J. Howard and Hunter Henry, but I feel like people are going to reach a little bit more than I'm comfortable with. How high would you be willing to take them? So O.J. Howard, I'm really, I don't know where people are going to go on him because if people are high on Mike Evans, which everybody always is, he's always like a consensus top 12 receiver. And if people are high on Chris Godwin, you know, drafting him in the, for good reason, in the fourth round, obviously it's like at some point they have to say, wait a minute, like, so where's the production for O.J. Howard? You're not going to have two. Or Jameis Winston's just an amazing pick. Exactly. And that's when it's like, if you start thinking that, then you better draft Jameis Winston because then you don't even have to worry about it because they're going to get theirs. I'm fine with drafting all four of them, just like I did with the Chargers last year. And then Hunter Henry got hurt. <laughs> I had so many best ball teams where it was just Phillip Rivers, Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, and Mike Williams. And uh, that didn't really work out. But I'm going to do the same thing with the Bucks this time, and it is going to work out. <laughs> it's very possible. I mean, Evan Ingram, I think, belongs in that group, too. They don't have the receivers there. Like, he's going to get peppered with targets. Like, when, when he, like, produced as a top six or top eight fantasy tight end, it's because Odell Beckham and Brandon Marshall got hurt, and he was kind of forced into a lot of targets. So I, I kind of feel that same way, because I don't think Sterling Shepard is a guy that's going to see, you know, 120 targets on the perimeter. I don't think he fits that role. Golden Tate is who he is. He's the, uh, Their wide receiver core is is questionable at best. So I think Evan Ingram is going to... S- what were they thinking? I don't know. I, I don't know. And it was a it was a wide receiver rich draft, and they didn't take any um to... Well, I mean, until I think, what, the sixth round. But... Evan Ingram is going to see, you know, 90, 100 targets easy. That's And that's why I have him at number five, whereas Hunter Henry, coming off the ACL, it's like, you know, now Mike Williams is there. That's going to take away a little bit of the touchdown potential because they never had the big touchdown scorer. I still like Hunter Henry, but and I think that's the cutoff is like O.J. Howard, Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry. If you can get one of those top six tight ends, that's where I feel comfortable with those guys. I want to remind people this about Hunter Henry. We've seen 115 targets from him thus far in his career. And in those 115 targets, better than Kelsey, better than Ertz, better than Gronk in that same time. That's per target. Now, the issue is, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen when he comes back, but we probably haven't seen the best of Hunter Henry yet. I think he's got a chance to leap all the way up to tight end number two. I think he's got crazy upside, but his floor concerns me a little bit more. Yeah, it definitely does. And that's, I don't know how people are viewing him yet. I can't wait to see like ADP because right now the AD- ADP right now, he's tight end seven behind O.J. Howard, obviously. Eric Ebron at number five. I don't even know if he's the starter. And then Evan Ingram at six. Hunter Henry, seven. Yeah, I I don't understand that one. I mean, the, but the thing is, that's what's really telling is that this is the time of the year where it's diehards that are influencing the ADP. Whereas once we get closer into August, we're going to see more of the casuals, you know, doing those mock drafts and doing those. And I think that Hunter Henry might even be lower. Uh, like, I think people are going to be higher on David Njoku. Eric Ebron's going to stay up there. Like, that's going to happen. I, I won't draft him over Hunter Henry. Eric Ebron just got a lot more competition for targets uh, this year. You know, Jack Doyle is going to be coming back healthy. They did get Devin Funches, who's an awesome red zone presence. He's a big body. Uh, and then adding Paris Campbell is just going to eat up some of those targets over the middle. Naheem Hines in his second year. Marlon Mack is healthy. You know, there, there's a lot of questions about Ebron, whereas if he doesn't score touchdowns, you're in real trouble with him. So for me, that's why I said I want one of the top six tight ends if I can help it. Ebron's part of that next group, though. Yeah, I want one of the top five because I, I, I get the Ingram love, but he just hasn't been especially efficient. And I'm worried that they are going to give a lot of targets to Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard. I would also put David Njoku in this tier, like you mentioned. Jared Cook at the end of this tier, his ADP right now is 10. ECR is 7. Uh, anyone else that you would sprinkle into this tier? Yes, I'm going to let it be known that Vance McDonald should absolutely be in this tier. Ooh, all right. Yes, Vance McDonald is a little too risky for me. I, I'll believe it when I see it. I love the talent. I like the upside, but um, I don't feel like he's safe. The issue with him has always been health. He hasn't been able to stay healthy, but with the Steelers not selecting a tight end you know high in the draft it kind of tells us that they're moving forward with Vance McDonald and last year like last year even though he missed a game all right he missed a game and Antonio Brown was on the roster Vance McDonald finishes the number 10 tight end okay Vance McDonald most people don't know this Vance McDonald scored more fantasy points than Rob Gronkowski he scored more fantasy points than Evan Ingram OJ Howard now granted those guys missed a couple games 
No, he did not. Are you serious? He did. He had 610 yards, four touchdowns on 50 receptions. So Vance McDonald, like the, when you look at it and you say Jesse James is gone, Antonio Brown's gone, that's over 200 targets for the taking. And it's not like Juju. Well, they're not going to throw 675 times this year. No, they're not. But Juju Smith Schuster's not going to, he's not going to see an increase in targets. Like he already saw 160 something. Like he's already up there. And it's like James Washington. Yeah, he's going to get a bump, but I don't see that much. You know, Dante Moncrief. Again, someone who's going to take up some targets. I think Vance McDonald has like legit upside. And if he's healthy, he can contend for a top six tight end spot. Right now, I have him at number nine. Uh, I just feel like that he's locked into quite a few targets. And he's part of that second tier with Ebron, with Njoku, and Jared Cook. Uh, that's how I view those guys. So Vance McDonald had 72 targets last year. Eric Ebron had 110. Jack Doyle's coming back. Antonio Brown's gone. Who has more targets this year, Vance McDonald or Eric Ebron? I think it's really close. It's possible that it's Vance McDonald. I think it's McDonald. I just think Ebron has more touchdown upside. Yeah, they they both do. And that's the thing. Someone's got to catch touchdowns in Pittsburgh. You know, Le'Veon's not there. Antonio Brown's not there. Juju can handle so many. But, I mean... Maybe it's just James Conner season or Benny Snell season. Going back to the Heath Miller days, you know, they've always used the tight end there in Pittsburgh. So uh, Vance McDonald is is very, very interesting. Yeah, that's a good one, man. I don't have him in that tier, but I could definitely see it. His ADP right now is number 11. ECR at 14. I don't really understand that. In this next group of players, uh, Delaney Walker, Chris Herndon, Austin Hooper, Trey Burton, I don't really feel especially good about any of them. By the way, TJ Hawkinson right now, ADP tight end nine. No! He's at ECR number 20 right now. Rookie tight ends just don't do all that well. I'm not seeing ADP 9. That's crazy. That is nuts. Um, I have no idea why people would be on that. Um, because So one, it's like TJ Hackinson is a good player, right? But he has two guys on that roster who are red zone monsters. Kenny Galladay is a mini Megatron or whatever you want to call him. Babytron, yeah. Yeah, so then you have Marvin Jones too, who's still on the roster that people seem to forget about. Like these guys are both touchdown machines. Like they can score touchdowns. So he's going to have to compete with them. Obviously, you know, you have a Matt Patricia team, so they're going to want to run the ball in the goal line. We saw that last year uh, with LeGarrette Blunt stealing some touchdowns. So I don't see it. I mean, if you want to tell me that he's like around tight end 15 to 20, that's fine. But to take him in the top 10, that's that's insane. Like over the last six years, I've done the research. There have been 70 tight ends who have been drafted inside the top six rounds of the draft. One of them finished as a top 12 option in fantasy football. And that was Evan Ingram when both, as I mentioned, Odell Beckham and Brandon Marshall went down with season. And Sterling Shepard was hurt too. I mean, they lost their top four wide receivers. Yeah. If Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones go down with injuries. Yeah, absolutely. TJ Hawkinson will be a top 10 tight end. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people like Austin Hooper for his upside. Uh, I'm okay with Trey Burton. I think he's a solid tight end 11 or 12. A lot of people are intrigued by Chris Herndon. I'm not buying that. Delaney Walker as well. My guy's Jack Doyle. I, I know Eric Ebron's there, but Jack Doyle's going to get his. A Andrew Luck always throws to the second and third tight ends. And remember, Jack Doyle was the starter for a reason last year. It's, that's so interesting. I mean, I think that they're using Doyle as the more traditional tight end where they're going to keep him in block more. And especially knowing they have the receiving threats now, they don't need him. No such thing in an Andrew Luck offense. Tight ends are the pass catchers. For sure. But Ebron might be first in that pecking order now, especially being in year two. Or they just move Ebron back to wide receiver like they were talking about doing last year. <laughs> yeah, the one I don't understand that you mentioned was Chris Herndon. I don't know why people want to draft him. His ECR right now is 11. <laughs> ADP has him at 16, which I think is about right. I've got him at 17. I have him at 20. I don't want him. Okay. Yeah, me either. I don't want him. I would rather have... I I'd rather have Jordan Reed, Greg Olson either. I would rather have TJ Hawkinson. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm being serious. And I Maybe even Mike Gusecki, just because eh. you don't know what you're going to get. There's a chance he could be a stud this year. They don't have anyone to catch passes in Miami. Eh, Devontae Parker. <laughs> but, yeah, you're right. But Gusecki... But, I mean, when that's what we're talking about, I'm okay with taking a lottery ticket on their tight end. I think that what we should, like, highlight here is that if you don't get one of these, you know, top... Top nine or ten tight ends, you're screwed. You're streaming anyways, so it's like, don't draft Chris Herndon. Don't do it. Um, In, in week one, he goes up against Buffalo who was like legit one of the top four teams against tight ends last year. So don't do it. Don't draft Chris Herndon. You're going to be disappointed. You just not. No, don't do it. I would be willing to bet that Dallas Goddard finishes with more fantasy points this year than Chris Herndon. And Dallas Goddard's not even the starter. I wouldn't draft Goddard over him, but it wouldn't surprise me that happened. Did he do it last year? Goddard had a lot of touchdowns, man. He only scored four touchdowns. I thought he scored more than that. But no, I mean, Herndon finished the tight end 15. Goddard was at 20. 
But yeah, it, Philly adding Deshaun Jackson to that offense, I think it takes away a little bit from the receivers. Um, they added Miles Sanders, who's a better pass catching running back than like a Josh Adams. So there's some things that'll pull targets uh, in different ways than than Goddard. But I don't like either of those guys. Like I, you know, I'm always drafting these high upside backup running backs. Like you know, two years ago it was Kareem Hunt. Last year it was Justin Jackson and. Uh, out we, you know, we talked about drafting Alvin Kamara as well. A lot of those have hit. A lot of them, not so much. Uh, James Conner was the guy last year that we drafted in every single league. Um, so, you know, we, we had a lot of shares of James Conner and Kareem Hunt that really paid off. This year, I'm going to be doing that as, as well, but I'm also drafting Dallas Goddard because if anything happens to Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard is immediately a top five fantasy tight end. I think I'd rather with him, I'd rather just like pay on the waiver wire, uh, when he does come there. Like if you're doing a free agent acquisition by budget, you better pay a hundred fab bucks because that's what I'm spending. <laughs> if you don't spend anything all year, but he would definitely walk in like that hundred percent. Like Goddard would walk into, you know, being a top three tight end. Yes. Yeah, like when Trey Burton was there and Zach Ertz went down. I mean, Trey Burton's, he, he's good. But he was immediately amazing. Are we forgetting about Delaney Walker? Like, do people like just not like him? I thought about talking about him, but I don't really see a point. I just don't understand why people like dislike him. Like the guy had just like up until last year when he got hurt, it's like the guy continually finishes a top 12 tight end. Like, and he's like, he's just consistent. You're not looking, you don't think that you're going to get a Zach Ertz, George Kittle type performance, but consistency. I mean, Greg Olson was consistent too until last year. And then he came back from injury. No, that was until McCaffrey arrived. But I mean, who's going to take away targets from Delaney Walker? I don't, I don't know. I just, I feel like he's someone that could be undervalued. Uh, Tennessee has a lot of weird guys that they love, and none of them are really all that good. Uh, Corey Davis is really good. AJ Brown's going to get his as well. But they brought in Adam Humphreys, and they've got all these like they are loaded with depth, but not very good depth. They've got a lot of guys who I think are going to split the targets. I think they're they should be better. They should be better than they are. But Marcus Mariota has dragged them down. Yeah, and I'm saying all this. Tennessee is almost certainly going to make the playoffs. It's just what they do. They've got a they've got a good team. They are so even across you know their entire depth chart. But uh, just in terms of fantasy appeal, not really seeing it. Yeah, they're, they're they're a weird team. All right, any other names at tight end you want to talk about? I know some people are high on a uh, Mark Andrews in Baltimore. Uh, what about for best ball leagues? Anyone you're targeting is your number two or number three tight end? I mean, in best ball leagues, you're, I mean, you're looking for a guy that has touched on upside. I think Trey Burton is a guy that I would target in best ball leagues. Uh, I want Gerald Everett. Jimmy Graham in uh, best ball leagues because, like, you know, it's his second year with Aaron Rodgers. I didn't want anything to do with Jimmy Graham last year. People laughed when I said that he wasn't a top 10 tight end for me. Um, but it's his second year. There's going to be some, some more trust acquired, provided that Graham can move. Uh, Jack Doyle would be a good best ball target, actually. Yeah, I think so as well. Is Cameron Bright going to be back with Tampa? Um, I don't know. I didn't really take a close look at his contract, but I mean, it seems like he's going to be, but because Jameis Winston loves Cameron Bright so much. <laughs> I think he just likes tight ends a lot. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he likes everybody because he's just really good, <laughs> including the defense because he throws a lot of interceptions too, <laughs> but he probably does pile up the fantasy points. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's all for tight ends and quarterbacks tags. Let's get on to the coaching changes. And you know, there's a lot of impactful offensive coordinator things. We talked about dirt cutter as well, but I just want to touch on these head coaches. These are the, the ones that are really important and easy to tell because you don't know if you're going to get one of these offensive coordinators coming in there. Who's going to be able to do his thing because who knows what the head coach is going to let happen. Uh, let's start at the top. We're just going to go in alphabetical order. So Arizona, Cliff Kingsbury led all of college football in snaps, and Arizona was bottom three in snaps last season. So I think this helps David Johnson a ton. Yeah, yeah. Kingsbury is going to bring this whole air raid offense that hasn't really worked in the NFL before, uh, that people have tried it, um, but it, it didn't really work. And, you know, now it's like the NFL is now it's ready for it, and it's, it's possible. Uh, I just think it's very telling that I've been waiting for the option all this time, and the NFL's never got ready for the option, so I'm always skeptical about these new things. Um, I don't believe in the option. I think that the the air raid offense, I, I would give that more hope than the the option. Oh, sure, yeah. But to me, what's telling is that Kingsbury wasn't even a winning coach in college. Like, that's a problem to me. Like, I understand the defense wasn't good. I, I, I do get that, but how do you win with a bad defense? A really friggin' good offense, and I mean, I have my questions about Kingsbury, but he threw the ball on 65% of his plays at Texas Tech. So there were only two teams in the NFL who threw the ball more than that in 2018. So they are going to run a lot of four wide receiver sets, three wide receiver sets with a tight end. Trent Shurfield, baby. Got to mention his name every once in a while. I don't think he's ever going to see the field again. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually pretty good, man. I don't think he's going to play. I think uh, Hakeem Butler will come on in four wide receiver sets. Kingsbury, 
my concern is that he's he's trying to fit players into his scheme rather than building around the players and you know Kyler Murray is better for an offense that has a bad offensive line and has, you know, very limited help at wide receiver. He can buy time. Like, that's the thing is that he should be able to do. But that's the thing is like, do you draft a quarterback to patch your offensive line or do you buy an offensive lineman to make life easier on your quarterback? You know, so I just feel like they overlooked their offensive line, which is going to be a problem. But the increase in plays, the increase in throwing the football, that's good things for all skill position players in Arizona. All right, man. The next coach we have is Zach Taylor. You already alluded to him a little bit earlier, and he is a disciple of Sean McVay. So uh, what do you think about that? (laughs) There's not much to say about Zach Taylor right now, and I think it goes back to... We don't know enough. Yeah, yeah. Like Matt LaFleur, people wanted to talk about, oh, he's a great OC because, you know, he was the offensive coordinator for the Rams. No, he wasn't. Like, he was never the offensive coordinator for the Rams. That was always Sean McVay. So let's let's stop pretending what we know about Zach Taylor. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? Yes, he was, but you're right. Okay, I see what you're saying. That's the thing is, like, I I love it when people tell me that. (laughs) I'm just like, okay, no, he wasn't. (laughs) Zach Taylor is saying the right things. Zach Taylor did say he's like, we're just starting to build our playbook. But what I what he did say is that that the starting point for their playbook will be the Rams offense. So that's always a good thing. Um, Obviously, that's going to help the wide receivers. It's going to hurt the tight ends, which, I mean, Tyler Eifert, how much much relying on him but does that mean john ross is now like the brandon cooks of that offense it, it doesn't matter you can't be the brandon cooks if you catch 40 percent of the passes thrown your way well when they're not catchable you can't catch them okay that's true Leave john ross alone sorry man i know you like john ross but he was bad last year and you know the thing is zach taylor can't make andy dalton good he can set him up to look better but he can't make him throw the ball to John Ross. But this is where landing spot matters so much. And this is why we've talked about it to like at nauseum. So John Ross, if he landed in Kansas City instead of landing with the Bengals and playing with Patrick Mahomes last year instead of with the Bengals and Andy Dalton, John Ross would be looked at as a completely different receiver. Well, we'd be taking him in the fifth round. <laughs> and maybe sooner. All right. Cleveland Browns get Freddie Kitchens and Todd Munkin. What do you think about this? So Kitchens obviously took over for the final eight games of last year. Kitchens is going to be the offensive coordinator. So Todd Munkin, a lot of people have already come to me and saying that, oh, it's Todd Munkin's offense. It's not Freddie Kitchens. That's not true. Um, they said that Todd Munkin is probably not going to be calling the plays in 2019. So therefore, don't go and think that they're going to be throwing the ball as much as the Bucks did to their wide receivers. I think the Browns, what they want to do under Kitchens, they want to play better defense. They want to play better defense and they want to play somewhat of a ball control style offense, but be able to beat you through the air. Adding Odell Beckham is obviously going to help in that, but they still have Nick Chubb. They did sign Kareem Hunt. Their defense is just, there's so much talent on that team. So I just, my concern is the plays. Uh, you know, we talked about the, you know, we want more plays for our offense. So four of the eight games under Freddie Kitchens last year when he took over as coach, four of those games netted 59 or less plays. That's a problem. That's not going to net very much fantasy production when those games happen. So uh, if the defense is getting better, I just worry about the pass attempts is all. So don't just go thinking, Todd Munkin's there. They're going to throw the ball a lot. It, that, that's not how it works. Yeah, and I get it. He's a really good fit with Baker Mayfield, and that's why he was the hire. But when you look at what Baker Mayfield did last year after he was the head coach, he was the QB9 behind guys like Dak Prescott, Ben Roethlisberger, even Josh Allen. And now he's got Odell Beckham, so he moves up. But I don't think Baker Mayfield is a QB, top QB5 like a lot of people are are thinking. Yeah, Baker was a lot more efficient. And that's the thing. I do think that adding, you know, having Nick Chubb in there as a second-year receiver. Jarvis Landry is now in his second year with Baker Mayfield. Antonio Callaway is no longer a rookie. Odell Beckham coming. There are a lot of things to get excited about. I I, I do think that that is the case with Baker. But I don't think he's going to be as consistent as people want him to be just because that defense is going to be better than people think. Who has more fantasy upside? Mitch Trubisky or Baker Mayfield? I think it's Trubisky. Knowing how little Baker ran the ball last year, I thought Baker would run more in the NFL. Like, I thought that he had 300 rushing yard upside, but it it doesn't seem like that's the type of quarterback he's going to be. And I always knew he was a throw first, but I thought it was going to be a little Russell Wilson kind of. Yeah, he can run. It's kind of like Andrew Luck, right? I mean, Andrew Luck's not the fastest. Baker Mayfield's a lot quicker than Andrew Luck, but he's going to put up 250 rushing yards a year and maybe sneak into the end zone once or twice. It's crazy to think that you could say it's potentially Mitch. Um, And here's the thing. So like looking at even last year, Bobby, Mitch and Baker each played 14 games. That's what they each played. Uh, Trubisky completed three more percent of his passes. Um, He threw for less yardage. Touchdowns 27-24, but Mitch ran for 421 yards and three touchdowns, whereas Baker was at 131. So, so Trubisky finished with 23 more fantasy points in the same amount of games with 50 less pass attempts. 
So, you know, that's that's the question. So I think that you might be onto something there with Trubisky. I think people underrate Trubisky as a whole. I think I have him as my number 13 quarterback, and I think he has upside for top eight. He put up a stretch last season. I don't remember when it was exactly, but it was a four-game stretch that was better than any four-game stretch in fantasy football history for a quarterback. In history? In the history of fantasy football. I didn't know that, but it was it was week four when it started against Tampa Bay. Um, he threw for six touchdowns that game. But yeah, so his stretch was he scored 43.5 points against Tampa, 27.3 points against Miami, 31.4 points against New England, and then 21.9 against the Jets. Okay, so maybe it was a three-game stretch, but regardless, he was amazing. And uh, that doesn't mean he's going to be incredible. Like Blake Wardles was the QB1 for a, a four-game stretch to end the 2017 season. Do not associate Trubisky with Bortles. Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> well, I already did that, and then I lost a bet. <laughs> so I had to pay for your golf. So I'm I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, like, you know, a three-game sample size isn't very big, but we've seen Trubisky show a huge ceiling. That's what I'm saying is that I, I think that that's why I think people are undervaluing him is because he did take strides in the right direction. He got hurt. Fell back a little bit again, but the rushing totals will always be there. And they stop showing confidence in him. Like, as soon as you do that to a quarterback and make him be someone that he's not, he's not going to play as well. When Mitch Trubisky was allowed to be who he is, you remember in the first week of the season, they were playing the Packers. First half, Mitch Trubisky was amazing. Second half, they had the lead. They're like, dude, don't lose this game for us. So he went to being a different quarterback, and he sucked. You have to let Trubisky be who he is, and if they do that, he's got top five QB upside. I agree with you. And I've told people that I think that like when people talk about Cam Newton, like how dominant he is as a fantasy player, it's like Trubisky could be like a Cam Newton light when it comes to his legs and then like offer more as a passer because he's a better passer than Cam Newton has ever been. And yes, I said that on a podcast, write it down. Tell me I'm wrong. People are going to fight us for this. Actually, you know what? People are going to fight you for this because if you guys have something to say about this, you can send it to Mike on Twitter <laughs> at Mike Tegley or NFL. I don't want to hear about it. He's the Bears fan here, but I agree, Tex. And that's the thing. I'm usually hateful against the Bears. Like, I don't want to own any of their pass catchers. I'd rather just own Trubisky. Oh, give me Allen Robinson. I'll take him. He's fine as a wide receiver three. Probably not at his price tag, but that upside, man, he's so still so young. They're going to spread the ball around there. That's why I want Trubisky. And that's Don't say you don't want his pass catchers. You're getting Anthony Miller in every league. I get him as late. I think he's got the upside that people think that they're getting with Allen Robinson, but I think Miller could be that guy. All right, and the Denver Broncos signed Vic Fangio. Defensive-minded head coach. You know, I, I always felt like Fangio was going to get a head coaching job. I don't know how he's going to do with it because he's definitely one side of the ball. He's defense only. So he hired an offensive coordinator, a first-time offensive coordinator, mind you, Rich Scangarello. That's not a real person. It is a real person. He was an assistant under Kyle Shanahan. That's really all we know. So I don't know if it was the greatest hire. So Joe Flacco QB1, that's what you're saying? The, no, downgrade, seriously. <laughs> the Broncos are not going to pass the ball very much this year. Look for the – they're actually going to run the ball quite a bit, and their schedule is not terrible. Uh, so Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman, those two should combine for a lot of rushing yards. I like that. All right, Green Bay Packers get Matt LaFleur. Uh, you already mentioned this a little bit, how – you know, we don't really actually know who he is. Here's my case on the floor, okay? People made the case that he succeeded under the Rams. He struggled in Tennessee, and he said that... And people say, this is what people say about the floor. They go, anyone would have struggled with that personnel in Tennessee. Wait a minute. He had an, a, a great offensive line. He has rock-solid receivers. Uh, yes, Corey Davis is rock-solid. Taewon Taylor is good. And obviously, they're adding more players now. But rock-solid running back duo with Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis... What am I missing here? Oh, that's right. Marcus Mariota. But Marcus Mariota flashed early in his career and LaFleur couldn't do anything to bring that player back out. Tell me all you want about the. Yeah, but we're not talking about Marcus Mariota. We're talking about the greatest quarterback in the history of the NFL. <laughs> no. Not in terms of accomplishments, guys. I don't want to hear this. OK, Tom Brady is the most accomplished quarterback. The most talented, greatest is Aaron Rodgers. Yes, but that's the thing. So Rodgers, here's the here's my issue. So LaFleur could have been like a Hugh Jackson type thing, like in terms of, you know how Baker, I was worried that Baker Mayfield was going to save Hugh Jackson's job. Fortunately, the Browns brass woke up and said, we need to let him go. And, you know, things started going better for the Browns and it's going to continue to go better for the Browns now that he's gone. But Aaron Rodgers is good enough to, to carry Mike McCarthy for as long as he did. All they need is Matt LaFleur to not be Mike McCarthy. They need him to not be bad. Like, but 25th in yards, 27th in points, that's not going to do it. You're not going to win by running the ball the way that Tennessee did at the end of the year. So 
I really wanted them to hire Pat Fitzgerald from Northwestern. I think that'd have been a great fit with Rodgers. I would have I would have preferred to see. I mean, I don't know if Josh McDaniels is just. I think he might be one of those guys that's like a, a better as a coordinator than he is as a head coach. But I don't want to write off the floor. I, I want to see him get another chance. I don't want to write off the floor yet. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna sit here and tell you he absolutely sucks. But what I do want to say is that stop making excuses for the guy. Like don't make excuses for him. I just want to see that offense flourish. And I just felt like it was a weird hire. I just felt like he didn't deserve a head coaching job yet. You know who I really wanted to see, and I think this is true of anybody who knows Mike Leach. He is just the man. Like, I'm not saying he's Bill Belichick or Sean McVay, but I think he might belong in that conversation if he ever gets to the NFL because he is a freaking genius. So, but some coaches, they, they just work better in college. You know, like um, Harbaugh, I think better college coach. You have Nick Saban. Uh, some of those guys, just they just work better in college. So it could be one of those cases. I don't know. Mike Leach is a freak of nature. All right, let's move on to the next team here. And we've got the Miami Dolphins hiring Brian Flores. Do we care about the Miami Dolphins for fantasy tags? Not necessarily. How is this going to help Devontae Parker? <laughs> uh, uh, well, he's not. Flores is a defensive coordinator. He's the he's on the defensive side of the ball. We really don't know much about him and how he's going to run that team, what he involvement he's going to have in the offense. So it, it's an offense that we really don't want many parts of right now. So it's Unless you get players and like, you know, you're taking a flyer in, in case that offense turns out to be better than you expected, like a Devontae Parker or something like that in the later rounds or an Albert Wilson. That's that's really it. Albert Wilson's just a GPP play. You don't want him in redraft leagues because 14 out of the 16 weeks, he's going to do nothing. And then two times he's going to break a touchdown. Yeah, but, you know, Flores could turn out to be like the next Bill Belichick, where it's just like he's defensive minded coach, but he has his team very well prepared. We don't know. He's a disciple of Belichick, but, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. But first time head coach, um, defensive minded one at that. So it, he doesn't do anything for offensive players. By the way, while we're on the Dolphins, because I don't think we're going to talk about them for the next two months, probably. Um, Davis said something on the show that I meant to respond to, but we kind of ran out of time with the picks that we were making. He thinks Kalen Balaj might be the starting running back in Miami. I don't think that's happening. Kalen Balaj is not a good running back. I don't think Kalen Balaj is. He is an extraordinary athlete. Yeah. But that doesn't really mean he's a good running back. Kenyon Drake is far superior as a running back. So unless he gets hurt, uh, I don't see it. Yeah. All right. New York Jets sign Adam Gase. Yes. And I know you've got big opinions about him. Ew. That's my opinion. Uh, <laughs> so outside of being with Peyton Manning for the first two years of his career, Adam Gase has not. That helps. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's Peyton Manning. <laughs> um, but outside of that, when Peyton Manning is basically the offensive coordinator, let's be real about this. Gase has not produced a top 16 scoring offense since Manning. In fact, none of his four other teams produced top 20 yardage as an offense. As a head coach in Miami, his teams averaged 57.4, 62.2, and then just a league low, 54.9 plays per game in 2018. Adam Gase holds grudges. He's not a good head coach. He's a terrible head coach, as a matter of fact. There was a part of me that was like, I, I want to give him some time as a coach just to, to, to make sure. No, no. He's a bad head coach. He might be a better coordinator than he is a head coach, but he might not even be a great coordinator. Maybe it was Peyton Manning, but... Adam Gase going there, I know so many people are excited for whatever reason, thinking he's going to develop Sam Darnold because Adam Gase developed Jay Cutler, right? Stop. Stop. I, Adam Gase is not a, a good hire for the Jets, and I feel bad for the Jet fans because they do have some talent on that team. The defense is getting better, but Gase is just the type of head coach. He, Like I said, the holding grudges thing, stop. Like He's that guy, and now that Le'Veon Bell's there, it's like he better learn to deal with that because otherwise those two are going to clash. And I, I just don't think it's a sexy offense that you want to have players a part of. Tags, I just figured I should be silent on that one since you clearly have big opinions on uh, Adam Gase. Let's move on to the last new head coach. It's Bruce Arians with the Tampa Bay Bucks, and I don't understand why Arizona ever got rid of him. He was the best thing that ever happened to the organization. Yeah, Arians, I'm happy to see him back in the NFL. He's a, he's a top five coach in the NFL, right? I don't think I'd say he's top five, but... Who would you put up there? Let, let's do that right now. So Belichick, McVay, Sean Payton. Doug Peterson's definitely up there. I like Matt Nagy a lot. Um, I really do. And I and the thing is, I'm sounding like a Bears homer because I've said I've liked Trubisky and Matt Nagy, but I really do like Nagy. You loved Matt Nagy before the Bears signed him. Yes, that was the coach. It was a good, good fit. Yeah. I think I'd put Arians in the conversation for number five, but yeah, that top four is pretty solidified. Yeah, McVay, Belichick, uh, Carroll is a better coach than people give him credit for. 
Yeah, that's true. He had a garbage roster last year, and they were pretty good. Yeah, I mean, there's some good coaches, Andy Reid, uh, but, you know, I got into that argument with a friend the other day uh, talking about Andy Reid, and they're like, he hasn't even won a Super Bowl. I'm like, yeah, that's true, but uh, at the same time, he's still a great head coach. Yeah, yeah, he definitely is. All right, so maybe Arians isn't top five, but I like him a lot. What do you think about the fantasy fit? I think it's good. I mean, like, obviously, you know, Carson Palmer wasn't a world beater before he had Bruce Arians, and he became a better quarterback under Arians. Uh, in his last nine years as a coach, Bruce Arians has produced seven top 15 offenses in yardage, including four of them in the top 10. Uh, the plays per game while with the Cardinals were consistently in between 64 and 68 plays per game. Uh, that's really good. And it didn't take time because the first year in Arizona, 65 plays per game. His wide receivers were targeted at least 60% of the time in every season with the Cardinals. By comparison, there were just nine teams who hit that number in 2018. So the wide receivers, when you talk about Mike Evans, when you talk about Chris Godwin, there's reason to get excited about those guys under Bruce Arians. I think so as well. So Davis took Chris Godwin in the fourth round. I don't think you need to do that. Are you going to have shares of Chris Godwin? I mean, you know I love him, but I don't think you're going to let me pick him as my guy to bet against you. I will in casual leagues for sure, uh, because Godwin's not going to be valued nearly as much. Be oh, I'm talking about our big bet where last year I won by picking Christian McCaffrey over. I don't even remember who your guy was. It doesn't really matter. Oh, you want Godwin in this one and you want to, you want me to pick someone? Well, no, I'm saying you're not going to let me pick Chris Godwin because I think you trust him enough. You didn't really love the Christian McCaffrey. Th you were okay with him, but not as high as I was. Yeah, for sure. I, I viewed Chris Godwin, Godwin like a Pierre Garçon. And Pierre Garçon earlier in his career was a well-rounded wide receiver who could kind of do it all. I, I, I view Godwin as that guy, um, maybe with a slightly bigger ceiling than Pierre Garçon. Um, but I think Mike Williams is a player that I would put in that category where it's like one of the, the, those two guys could both, you know, easily be top 15 wide receivers this year. But again, Chris Godwin's concern is that he's got to deal with Mike Evans. I think we all know where this is going, by the way. I'm probably going to be going with Chris Carson. And you're going to bet someone against Chris Carson. So we're going to need to figure out who that is. We've got like three months to decide, though. That's a good one. Yeah, it probably is going to be Carson because you're all over him. Yeah, why not, dude? He's the greatest. <laughs> you can pick Saquon Barkley if you want. I don't care. I'll take Marlon Mack. You take Chris Carson. Well, I like Marlon Mack, too. You can't just, <laughs> no. You can't take all the guys. Yeah, that's true. I can't. <laughs> all right, man. That's all for today's show. Uh, that was fun. It was. It was. It was just a different show where we got to talk about some different things and talk about some of the coaching changes. And, you know, we'll be talking about those as we go through the episodes. But this was a good, like, primer to uh, those who have been away from the NFL for a little bit. We have a really fun show coming up, by the way. And I think some of you may know that this is coming up because you follow us on Twitter at Fantasy Pros. We're doing a family feud type of thing called Fantasy Feud. So keep your eye out for that. It's also going to be in the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash fantasy pros. Thanks to the sponsor of today's show, pristineauction.com. And make sure to sign up for that signed Juju Smith Schuster helmet that we're going to be giving away at fantasypros.com slash contest. It takes about 30 seconds to enter. Again, that's fantasypros.com slash contest. For Mike Daglier, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.